Well, thanks, Mark. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Those of you whom I know, and even more so to those of you who I don't know, uh, you took more of a risk, uh, or perhaps <laughs> less of a risk in coming here. Um, so thanks for being here. And, and I guess, yeah, I would just love to first by saying, start by saying thank you to everyone that um, supported me so much on my mission over the past couple of years, whether that was in the preparation, which very much took place at Colgate, or the helping me discern that that's what God was calling me to, um, keeping in touch with me while I was there, um, actually through writing me or just by remembering me and praying for me. Uh, I know that a lot of you did that also. Um, so, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. And thank you for listening right now. Um, I'm actually a little bit nervous, which is funny because I'm more nervous than when I was as a student giving Newman lunches. Um, but I think it's just because it matters a lot more to me now. Like I really, um, I just hope that I'm able to, to share some of the beautiful things that I was able to live over the past couple of years and do it justice to, uh, to our friends in Uruguay and to God. Um, but we'll also try to keep it somewhat brief so that you can, you can ask questions because I think sometimes that's... Um, where the most beautiful conversation happens is when I'm able to, to answer what you might be wondering. Okay, so to start off, um, <laughs> you have a beautiful picture of Julieta, one of the little girls who's our neighbor, just waking up on a Saturday morning, popping her head out of the window. Um, so she's giving you the welcome to Uruguay. So a couple years ago, I was getting ready, three years ago, I was in your seats thinking about graduation as a Colgate sen senior. And about this time of year in October, um, that question was hitting me really hard of, what are you going to do next year? What are you going to do with your life? And it was a little bit of a frustrating question because, um, I don't know, in a lot of ways it didn't seem very fair to me. And I, I don't know why, but um, it just felt very demanding of, of others to ask me that. It, and I felt like it should be a more personal question that I didn't want kind of thrown at me all the time. And I realized that the reason why is because I was asking the same question and it... Um, wasn't fair to God. I was saying, what do I want to do? What do I want to be when I grow up? What? Me, me, me. Um, and so one day I had the grace of, of realizing that in prayer and asked God for the first time, okay, but, but what do you want from me? Like, this is, um, this is my life, but it, it's also your life. Everything that I have is a gift. So, so Lord, what do you want from my life? And the second I asked that, everything changed. Um, first of all, I had a lot more peace with, with the question in general. Like, it didn't bother me as much. Um, and I was able to discern that that God was asking me to, to give him my life in a very concrete way for a couple of years. So I started to look at missions and found Hearts Home, which is a Catholic movement that um, is French, and it started in 1990 and now has homes all over the world in 30 different countries and about 45 different homes. Their homes made up of young volunteers. Um, there's over about 200 volunteers like me. There's also lay consecrated members, there's priests, and there's sisters. And the most common experience is to go to another country and to live there between one and two years in an in international community, four or five volunteers, and to live with the people, sharing their daily life, visiting, um, and just living a very simple life at home, the simple life of Jesus and Mary in, in Nazareth. So I'll, I'll share some more about that as I, as I speak about my experience, um, but just so you have a little bit of, of the background of what my new Hearts Home family looks like. So with any religious community or, or movement, um, kind of the, the defining characteristic is their charism, um, how they live out the mission that God has given them, um, how the Holy Spirit works through them. So our charism with Hearts Home is compassion, or suffering with, literally means in, in Spanish, compasión, to suffer with someone. So um, we take Mary as, on, as our model, Mary at the foot of the cross, who was present with Jesus at his crucifixion, one of the few people that was present to the end. And she wasn't doing anything. There are often very beautiful paintings you can see of Mary. She was just standing there, fully present to Christ, standing. She wasn't <coughs> prostrate like Mary Magdalene. She wasn't, um, she was very strong, very attentive to her son, but she also wasn't doing anything. Um, but her presence in some way was very consoling and I think essential to, to her son's passion. And so that's what we try to live out in the places where God sends us, is to be present to our neighbors, to those who are suffering, um, and this, just to be there, I think there's something that is very remarkable to our neighbors that there are four or five people from places all over the world that have chosen to live with them in their slum and to share their daily life. Also, Mary is a big part of our spirituality. We pray the rosary every day. And our, um, our founder got the intuition to form Hearts Home while he was praying the rosary. So we always start off our afternoon with Mary accompanying us. 
So when I left Colgate, um, a lot of you guys were, were blessed to, to see me off, and I went to Buenos Aires in Argentina, uh, to a place called Villa Jardín, which Villa in, in Argentina is another way of saying like slum, um, or favela in, in Brazil. So I was in Villa Jardín just for three months. I was supposed to be there for two years, but in the end, we were forming a new home in Uruguay, just across the river, in Montevideo. And so I ended up leaving with two other of my community members to go form a new Hearts home. It was very providential and definitely very intelligent of the Lord to, to place me in a Hearts home that had already been there for 20 years before going to form a new one, because I learned a lot in three months. Um, learned a lot and also was just very formed by, by the people more than anything with whom we were living. Um, friends that had known Hearts Home from day one, so they were friends of Hearts Home for 20 years, and in a neighborhood that normally strangers can't go into because it's pretty dangerous, um, because of drug violence, because of robbing. But walking in with my rosary on my wrist and a very American present, um, people quickly picked up that I wasn't from there, and they would ask me, oh, are you a Hearts Home volunteer? And immediately I was welcomed into what otherwise would be a very dangerous place to go as a, as a white American. So that was a very beautiful experience, um, and also really cool to be formed by, by Argentinians who had come to know Christ and, and love him through the presence of Hearts Home there over 20 years. So this is a picture of our, our farewell with a lot of the children. There are a lot of, a lot of children in this neighborhood um, who are always outside, always knocking on the door, frequently just asking for a cup of water because sometimes they're thirsty, but a lot of times they just want an excuse to knock on the door and, <laughs> and bother us at any time of the day. Um, so that was our farewell. I will show you a quick video because I think it's very beautiful to see a little bit of um, an image of a place where we are. So this one was done in Villa Jardín um, on, the on their 20 year anniversary, which was a little bit after I left to go to Uruguay. And in the background you're, you'll hear um, the prayer of St. Francis of Assis. Um, St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> it's in Spanish, but I'm sure a lot of you might be familiar with it in English. The Lord make me an instrument of your peace, where there is hatred, let me so love. And we pray that prayer every day in all of our hearts' homes around the world in the morning. Um, so enjoy this. volume. Señor, haz de mí un instrumento de tu paz. Donde hay odio, ponga yo amor. Donde hay ofensa, ponga yo perdón. Donde hay discordia, Ponga yo unión. Donde hay error, ponga yo verdad. Donde hay duda, ponga yo fe. Donde hay desesperación, ponga yo esperanza. Oh maestro, que no busque yo tanto ser consolado como consolar, ser comprendido como comprender, ser amado como amar. Porque dando se recibe, olvidando se encuentra. Perdonando se alcanza el perdón. Muriendo se resucita a la vida eterna.
So those are just some images of, of where I first fell in love with, with the mission and with the people. Um, I actually just got to go back on my way back from Uruguay and see all of these kids, you know, two years older, uh, which is very beautiful. And they all remembered me so well, which was also incredibly humbling. Um, there's also a lot of great videos on our website, if you ever check that out, um, that are in English and explain the mission, but I particularly love that one. Okay, so after three months, uh, we were sent off to Uruguay. We took a ferry from Buenos Aires to Montevideo because uh, it's just a, a short little ways away. And in a lot of ways, it's very similar to Argentina in the food and the way that they speak. Um, there's a lot of cultural similarities, but there's also a lot of differences. And I think one of the main differences between Uruguay and, and Argentina has to do with the Catholic Church. So in Argentina, um, it's over 90% Catholic, at least nominally. Of course, um, not necessarily everyone has church going. But it's very much, the church is still together with the state, so politics are very much intertwined with religion. Um, every time less, but, but still, that's, um, that's a truth. When you're in the bus, you'll see Mary on the side of, of the bus. Um, there's images of Our Lady of Luján everywhere. Um, as you might imagine in a lot of Latin American countries, that's pretty common, like in Mexico with Our Lady of Guadalupe. But unfortunately, in, unfortunately or this is how it is, in Uruguay, that's very different. So because of independence, after independence in 1830, a lot of different anti-clerical ideas started to be formed, and the church was separated from state in 1918. So it's been a long time, especially for a Latin American country. Um, and at the current time, the president did a really good job of secularizing society in a pretty extreme way. I think that the best example of that, perhaps, is the concept of holidays there, where in different secular societies, um, frequently just Christian holidays are no longer celebrated or honored, perhaps. But in there, they've been completely secularized to where they're the exact same dates. People even get vacations, but they have different names and different ways of celebrating them. Um, so Christmas is the day of the family. Immaculate Conception is the day of the beaches, um, coming from when the bishop used to bless the beaches on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th. Now it's just the day that everyone goes to the beach. Um, the week of Holy Week is called the Week of Tourism. And everyone gets five full days off. And that's, everyone asks, like, oh, what are you going to do for tourism? Where are you going? It's also called the week of beer sometimes. <laughs> uh, and it's shocking because even church-going Catholics call it the week of tourism. Um, even that are preparing, you know, to go to Mass during Holy Week, say, oh, what are you doing for tourism? <laughs> it's Holy Week. <laughs> um, so I, that's just an example to show that it's been, um, society has been largely changed um, to become very secular. Uruguay is also something of an anomaly in that they're, it's the most atheist country in the Americas. Um, so there's, as of 2013, 41% of the population identified, um, or 38, sorry, as nothing, as being atheist. And there was a particularly large, shi large shift in the last 20 years, since 1996. Um, and that's mostly because, because of, of politics, presidency. But also in the late 1900s, there were still a lot of immigrants coming in from different parts of the world, from Spain, from Italy that still were very Catholic, so it was kind of rejuvenating um, Uruguayan faith and society. But now that immigration has, has stopped, um, that there's not as much immigration, and kind of um, people are starting to take on more of the Western ideas of, of liberty and freedom, but sometimes in a very skewed perception of what freedom is. Um, abortion is legal, marijuana is legal, um, same-sex marriage has been legal for a very long time. So those are, are things that, um, that's a whole other conversation that I won't get into, but kind of where we found ourselves in this society and in a very different place than in Argentina. There's also a lot of beauty in that because the people that went to church were very faithful. Um, so we encountered a very kind of small, tight-knit family in the Catholic Church in Uruguay. People were also very blessed by, by our presence. Um, and it, it was very humbling because, of course, in a lot of the churches, there aren't many people and there are fewer youth and fewer children. There are a lot of elderly people that still continue to go to Mass. And so in our parish, we were the only young people there. And so the women immediately were, were very excited to have us over, to, to tell us about their faith, to, to share with younger people, um, especially women that are hurting because their children and their grandchildren no longer have a faith in God. This is... Cardinal Sterla, who is the acting cardinal and the Archbishop of Montevideo, who invited us to, to form a home where we did. Um, and this is him walking the streets with us in our neighborhood. So as you can see, a very tight-knit community. I, I got to cook for the cardinal twice in our home. Um, it, it was a really amazing ecclesial experience to get to know 
priest on a, on a very personal level, having them over to our home, having them celebrate Mass in our chapel. So I just want to um, share a few quotes with you. Um, because while I did live a very simple life, um, study was somewhat involved in that also, getting to read a lot of wonderful church leaders, getting to, to have time for Lexio Divino and, and spiritual reading every day, um, which was very enriching. And one saint in particular, well, I say saint, he is um, a priest that is now servant of God, and he could be the first Uruguayan saint someday. There's no, there has not been a saint yet. Um, is Padre Cacho, and he lived about a neighborhood away from us and had a very, very similar mission and passed away in 1992. So it was really neat to kind of get to know this, this holy man through his readings, but also through talking to people in our neighborhood that knew him when he was working there. So I, I threw in a couple of quotes just because um, I think they speak a lot to our mission. So I feel the imperative need to live in a poor neighborhood and do as they do, not as a tactic of infiltration, camouflage, or demagoguery, not even as a prophetic gesture of something, but to find him anew because I know that he lives there, that he speaks their language, that he sits at their table, that he participates in their anguish and hopes, neither as a father, dispatcher of sacraments, but as someone who is going to do with them an experience of faith, a shared path. Perhaps I can tell them in their language of pain and frustration <coughs> that there among them is he, he who can change death into life, denial into hope. So more or less, that's our mission. Um, St. Teresa's feast was yesterday, and we have a, a huge devotion to her and the concept of doing small things with, with a lot of love. Um, and so we spend a lot of our time in our home, cooking, cleaning, inviting people over, just doing the simple tasks of everyday life, but with a lot of love towards God. Also, um, being present to others is a big part of our mission. So always being in our homes so that somebody can come over, somebody can knock on the door and also just being very present in the neighborhood. Um, and that just comes along with, with living like our neighbors, so shopping in the same places, um, not having technology very much in our home, um, having a, a very kind of simple life to be able to, to be one with our neighbor, not having any sort of heating, so when it's cold, everyone's outside in the sun drinking mate, hot, a hot drink together. The other beautiful thing about being present to others is that we have the presence um, of the Blessed Sacrament in our home. So the first room when you walk into our home is the chapel, and it's a place where we spend a lot of time in prayer every day. We have adoration, we pray the rosary there, we pray all of the liturgy of the hours together, but also we can invite our friends in to pray. And it's, it's a beautiful thing because um, I think a place of, of quiet and peace is attractive to anybody, just like our candle at Mass last night, that it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that believes in Christ or, or is Catholic, to appreciate the beautiful quietness of, of what adoration is. And so that was a gift to be able to offer that to our friends and also incredibly essential to our mission that everything was rooted in prayer. We wouldn't have been able to sustain some of the things that we lived, um, some of the, the sorrows that our friends permitted us to, to share with them without having Christ in the center of it all. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about God's providence. I think the, the beautiful part of a, um, forming a new home that's unique to any other experience is absolutely relying on God's providence. We arrived and each one of us had our individual belongings and nothing else. So we ended up needing to have a whole home put together. Coming from Colgate, where I had more than what I needed, um, and having to ask our neighbors for a blanket during the winter, um, for plates for our, to eat off of, <laughs> forks and knives. Everything we had in the home was donated. And it was beautiful because while we did meet some, some wealthier friends that were also very generous to us, a lot of what we had in our home was from our neighbors that were not giving from their excess. They were giving their, you know, their, two, their two cents, just like the widow. And it's, it's very beautiful to be in a place where everything has a name. Like this plate was donated by Sylvia, this blanket's from Liliana. Um, and that was one of the hardest things for me to leave because it was just feeling absolutely surrounded by your friends and by God's love all the time in a very concrete way. However, we also had to beg for friends. We were new. Nobody knew us. So the, the elderly women at the parish were kind of <laughs> easy friends, if you will, um, which was a gift while we were first getting used to being in a new place. But that wasn't, um, you know, God, I think, wanted to take us a lot further than, than just our parish. 
And so we ended up frequently just walking around the neighborhood praying the rosary, asking friends to introduce us to their friends, meeting large families, a family with 18 children, uh, 40 grandchildren, 30 great grandchildren. <laughs> so you meet families like that and you've already met almost half the neighborhood. So that, that was neat, um, but also sometimes I was reminded that friendship is a miracle. It's a miracle every time, and it's something that we have to ask for. It's not, um, it's not just given freely. It's, it's a grace. And so I put this picture up here um, with my mom when she came to visit, with Sulema, because um, she is one of our, our best friends now, a very, very generous, giving woman. Um, and this is the only picture I have of her home. And her home is very important because <laughs> Uh, she has a very, very simple home, but takes a lot of pride in it, and is very good about welcoming everybody into it. So I actually met Tulema one day while I was walking through the poor part of the neighborhood, and she started yelling at me because she did not understand our mission. We, there used to be a soup kitchen in our home, and she was wondering why there no longer was, what were we doing, we're missionaries. So I, you know, I tried to explain, but listen, you know, we no longer need a soup kitchen because the children are now fed at school. Malnutrition is not really the problem anymore. Now our neighborhood is horrible for drug violence. It's actually the most well-known in Montevideo for, for drug violence and for gang violence. So, you know, I was trying to explain to her, we're, we're just here to be a presence of love. We we're just here to be your friend. And she was not, not getting it. So frequently we'd have that conversation, that argument, probably during two or three months. So one day I stopped and I looked at her and said, but are we your friends? Am I your friend? And that changed everything. That simple question of, of seeking her friendship, she said, well, of course you are, and you know my home is always yours. I said, but Salima, I, I don't even know where you live. <laughs> so she grabbed me by the hand, took me to her, her home, what we, we, went, we might call a, a shack, and, and showed me everything. Showed me all of her stuffed animals, <laughs> um, everything that she had, and since then has always invited us back. My parents, when they arrived, they had to come to, to her home. Um, we walked with the cardinal to her home. <laughs> uh, if you ever come visit, go to visit Uruguay, she will take you to her home. Um, but it, she has provided us a very beautiful friendship. We've learned so much from her. And, and a woman that has had a very, a very hard life. <coughs> so another quote from Padre Cacho, which is, evangelization does not exist. There's this man who must be recognized with dignity, image, and likeness with that man who must fill his, his retina with the vision of his destiny of fullness and love, freedom, and truth. There's the Christian who lives that real vision and toward it directs all his forces with other men with whom they give the world guarantees of that destiny. And so a big part of our mission with Hearts Home is trying to restore the dignity, um, human dignity to our friends. And at the same time having our own human dignity restored in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of women that don't take care of their bodies, um, a lot of women who have five or six children all from different fathers, who don't feel like they deserve to be loved, a lot of children who don't have a father around and whose mother is absent, who, who find themselves on the street for most of the day. And while it is sad to see people that aren't well cared for, it's, um, the saddest part is seeing that their lack of dignity for themselves. Um, lack of caring for themselves and their children. And so frequently just, just by living our life, um, being a community, an international community, I lived with two French girls, a Polish boy and a Portuguese boy. Um, and living and seeking to get along, which was not always easy, and, and be that loving example of what a family can be, and welcoming people into to our family life. And then also going out together by two and, and sharing in their life with them was sometimes all that it took we didn't necessarily need to, to bring up God. Also, I think our presence was, um, was very provoking to a lot of people in the sense that we would just be sitting down drinking tea or mate or, or coffee and, and talking about the weather on most visits or, or soccer games. But frequently it was them who would ask us about God or about Christ because they knew that we were missionaries and, and they were seeking something. Also, when, when something went wrong in their lives, they would frequently come to ask us for help. Um, so frequently we would go to the hospital with friends. I got to visit um, the jail with a really good friend to see her daughter, um, to see her sons a couple of times. Whatever it was. So just to, to introduce you to a few of our friends. Um, one of the, the really 
profound things that I learned being on mission is the difference between moral and theological virtues, and that moral virtues, you know, being doing good, what, what, what society would consider as good, not doing drugs, working, taking care of your family, kind of the, the values that we've all grown up with in a lot of ways in America. And then theological virtues, being faith, hope, and love, being the virtues that are a lot deeper <laughs> um, and what make us holy and what will be judged on in the end. So it was beautiful to see friends that maybe morally were struggling because of the situation in which they were in, but yet had a theological virtue that was outstanding, like much better, much more faith, much more love than I've ever seen in my life or could experience myself. So for faith, I, am, I put up a really holy friend of ours who, when we first got there, showed us around her entire neighborhood. She lives in one of the most violent parts, and she's the only person from that part that goes to church. And so she showed us, to, she introduced us to all of her neighbors, walked the streets with us, and was just a very dear friend to ours. And about a year ago, she got really sick with cancer. And so it was hard to see this strong woman that had introduced us to the neighborhood so dependent upon us. She could no longer leave her house. So we'd go to pray the rosary with her, and in the end we were bringing her communion um, once or twice a week. And it was incredible to see her faith. She was living just for Jesus, really and truly. She had a very large family, but nobody else was a believer. And so even though her family was always with her, thanks be to God she had people that took really good care of her, she would just wait for our visit because there was something different about about our presence that she wasn't finding in her family. Also, concretely, we were bringing Christ to her, which was, you know, a very humbling experience for us. She would wait all day, set up her little bedside table, put, put out her white mantle, not eat anything until we came, just awaiting her king. So, uh, she's now a saint. She passed away a month ago. Um, so I'm certain that she is with our Lord. So the example of hope, I put up this dear friend of ours um, who had four of her six children in jail for almost all of their lives. So you can see she's a little bit older. Um, her boys are in their 40s and have been in and out of jail since their teenage years. And she continues to visit them once a week, every week. Um, waits in line. I waited with her once for five hours just to go through the horrible security to get in. Brings them whatever she can manage to get through because they have very, very poor conditions, pretty bad food. And visits them every single week. And what's most amazing to me is that she's so hopeful. Like, she still, when she's at home, is always talking about the day when all of her children will be out of jail and they'll be together. And I, I don't know. Like, it's hard for me to be even that hopeful for, for her children. It, it just seems very improbable at this point. They, some of them even have grandchildren now that are in jail. Like, it's, it's our children, excuse me, her grandchildren that are in jail. It seems like a very hopeless situation on the outside, but somehow um, she draws an incredible hope from from what must be her faith in God, because th there's no other way that, that she could be filled with such, such beautiful hope. And for the example of love, um, these are some pictures from Cotolengo, which is the men's home that we visited, men's and boys' home. There are over 200 men and boys that were abandoned by their families, almost all of them, um, with a mental handicap. Kind of the, the last case, the worst case scenario, this is the last place that they could go. And so it seems like it should be a very sad place. In a lot of ways, there were a lot of sorrows that we shared and that we were able to see. But on the other hand, it was the most joyful place of our mission. You would just walk in and be embraced by, by little boys, embraced by, by men. It, it's a pretty big place. They're all able to walk around. And they have daily mass every day. So you're able to go to mass with the residents, um, which is definitely the most colorful mass I've ever been to. <laughs> because I think all of the distractions that one might experience during Mass in their head, they're experiencing with their body. You know, getting up, walking around, going to drink mate. Like <laughs> uh, and I, that hit me one day. I was like, you know what, that's not really fair to be, to be judging or, or, or thinking wrong about this because I'm just as distracted. It's just not a physical distraction. Like, they're probably more focused than I am, you know? Um, it, was, it was beautiful to share. share the Eucharist with them, but also just friendship. Um, it was like our home in the end. We could walk in. They, they gave us permission to go anywhere, to any of the rooms, to any of the floors. We'd go at least two or three times a week. Um, and also, so their love towards us, but their love within one another. Like the little boys would call each other brothers. They took care of each other. Uh, little Martin here is really concerned for, for Facundo because he's very autistic um, and would injure himself a lot, as you can see, and just had a very difficult life. And Martin, you can just see in his eyes, he's very compassionate. 
Um, and so seeing their love among their brothers, they would pull us over and be like, look at, look at beautiful Facundo, or look at my beautiful brother. Um, yeah. So just a, a quick note on discipleship. This is our going away mass with my French sister, Carol. We ended up leaving at the same time. And two of our parents, grandparents, if you will, um, who took really good care of us, and one of our little girls. Just thinking about discipleship as saying yes to the Lord um, and giving him everything, everything that he asks, which is not always easy, but it's always worth it. Um, and more than anything, I think discipleship, discipleship is a personal encounter with, with the Lord um, in a very real way, giving him time of prayer, but also just um, a personal encounter with others, desiring the best for somebody, really and truly for their soul, for their eternity. I think that's what we're all called to do. Um, like Mark was saying last night about St. Therese, that we all have a vocation to love deeply one another. And I think that's something that like, I finally was able to, to realize more and more my senior year. Um, that was always in my heart, but, but trying to live that in a very concrete way because there are a lot of people at Colgate that are really suffering in some real ways. Some people that are very lonely, very hurt, very broken, um, that find their identity in academic, that, that put their identity in, in very um, superficial things that can be very hurtful. And so, I don't know, I'm just so inspired by seeing you all here because you're all called to this mission of, of love and compassion exactly where you are. Um, exactly where God has placed you in this moment. That's, that's the beautiful thing about a vocation, that I get to go to other countries and do this, which I didn't expect and which I'm so thankful for. But in the same breath, being here over the past month with my family and friends and, and seeing their lives and how they're living this vocation of love has also been very beautiful to see that, that it doesn't have to be on mission in another country. Um, so that's kind of a dichotomy of what I'm saying. One thing, you know, give the Lord everything and be open that he, if he is calling you to, to some wild adventure. Um, but also just to be, to be open to him in every moment and in the small things and in obedience of where he has placed you. I was a molecular biology major at Colgate for four years and, and I'm thinking of being a missionary for the rest of my life. You know, it could be easy to say, why was I at Colgate studying biology for four years? Why did I put myself through organic chemistry? Uh, <laughs> But that's where the Lord placed me, um, and that's where he spoke to my heart, and he drew, he drew me to him. So just to, to not fear um, the uncertainty of, or the confusion of where you might be. And that's just a good friend of, of ours that was, <laughs> I put with opening one's heart, which I kind of talked about, um, because he was initially very hard to love, <laughs> would just come over at any time of day, uh, a little quirky. <laughs> But we ended up having an incredibly beautiful friendship once, once I finally opened my heart up to him. So Padre Cacho says, I'm not the same anymore because I've learned many things, but I've learned without books. I've learned without lessons. I've learned without lectures. I've learned without chalkboards, without classrooms. And my teacher has been the poor, who sometimes molds you, but for your good. It is a school of humanity. It is a school of solidarity. It is a school of love. And it is a school of the cross, too. But from there, life is born. That's why I feel very happy. And although I suffer with the suffering of my neighbors, who have faces, who have names, have histories, at the same time, I could not live outside this place. That's why I came, like responding to a call. <coughs> That's just a, a beautiful neighbor of ours. Um, so at the risk of, of taking away from Padre Cacho's beautiful words, <laughs> that's more or less what I, what I feel, and um, a lot of joy and, and thankfulness. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, for the current moment, I'll be continuing on this journey. And now I get to go to Brazil, uh, to a place called La Fazenda do Natal, which means um, the farm of the nativity. So the nativity is their patron saint there. Every home has its patron saint. Ours in, in Uruguay was St. Francis. Pray to him on Wednesday for our community, please. Um, but so I'll be going to Brazil, uh, to Salvador de Bahia, which is on the coast. And here it's one of the unique Hearts Homes because it's more like a Hearts Home Village is what they call it. It's a conglomeration of 10 homes that are made up of volunteers like myself and also lay consecrated members, sisters and priests, and Brazilians. So we live together in small communities um, with single mothers, um, with Brazilian children. There's an autistic boy who's been there almost his entire life. 
And as you can see, it's a little bit more secluded. So in the afternoons, we will go to local villages, local slums to do kind of the apostolate that I was doing in Uruguay. But also our mission here is 24-7 at the Facenda caring for the Brazilians that are living with us and trying to, to restore their dignity um, in a certain way, but also just to, to share life, to share love with them. So I think I'll stop there <laughs> so that you guys might have a little bit of time for questions, if there are any. Thanks. Mr. Pat Gillick. <laughs> uh, someone who also did, like what you said, spoke to me. <laughs> someone living kind of not as awesome as you. Um, a life of like presence and ministry and um, voluntary poverty. Um, what did you, I guess you kind of, what was the mission of, what is the mission for Hearts for Home? Is it just just to be in the, the neighborhood and whatever, like just live with everyone? Or where did you do other like outreach? So the main mission is just to, to live where we are and to make friendships there, um, to be present. Um, you know, we did go to a, an apostolate once a week to, to Cotolingo, to the men's home. We also were visiting a children's home about once a week. We tried not to, to have too many apostolates because that took away from our time in the neighborhood and away from our availability to say, oh, yeah, I can go to the prison with you all day tomorrow. <laughs> so that that's something that we, we don't have a ton of structured times. Um, every afternoon we are going out into the neighborhood and visiting our friends. But I don't know. It's, it's interesting because that's why it is a harder mission to explain to a lot of people um, or even to, to family and friends when they're asking you <laughs> um, because it's not about the doing. It's about the being. Um, and, you know, I, although we do have CFRES and we do have, you know, some facts that we can, we can make a year in report, and we do every year, it, it's not so much that that, that is our mission. It's, it's being present to others. And, and that's actually why I put this, this picture of Teresita the up there because... Um, She's just one of our friends that reminds me of Matthew 25 where Jesus says, you know, would, when you did this to one of the least of these, you did this to me. And th that's why I felt called to a second mission is because I could just look at a few faces and perceive their love for me and, and their love for God through my being there. And it just seemed clear that if I could just change the life of one person, um, that I, I would give my life to do that, you know. Um, and so I, I think a lot of our mission is very, very hidden. Um, and, and being at a home that had 20 years was cool to see that, too. To see that, like, there were so many miracles that had happened over the years that a volunteer being there for a year or two would never experience, but just had to faithfully and dutifully live their mission without seeing the fruits of, of the, mis the mystery of the, vis of the mission. Yeah, Alec? So moving from Colgate to such a prayerful community, you said you had hours of adoration and daily mass. I mean, what was that transition like? Was it at all difficult to move into such a time of you know prayer and? Sure, that's a good question. Um, that's one of the things that really drew me to Hearts Home was the prayer life because I was really seeking that. Um, at Colgate, it was kind of like a gradual process for me. Uh, like my first year, I was going to mass, praying a little bit, not really, more or less. The second year, I I started to pray a lot more. By my final year, I was you know saying a the rosary once or twice a day. I had a, a holy hour or an hour of adoration every day. I was going to daily mass. So I had actually gone on a, a two-month mission before my senior year. That, that was very transformative. And that made me just fall in love with prayer life and with God. And, um, and so it was a little bit of a gradual thing. But for others, it's, it's a bit extreme to go, you're right, from praying maybe a little bit to, to daily mass and adoration every day, four hours of prayer. But like I said, I think that um, the mission is impossible without that. Um, you just really, when you're experiencing such extreme sorrow and joy, it's really hard not to have a place to turn to the Lord. Um, and when you're also so attentive to, you know, having kids knock on the door at all times, like being able to go into the chapel and be silent for an hour is really critical. Can yeah, you Father. Tell me a little bit about uh, how your relationship of trust in God has, like, grown over the years and how you've seen that grow yeah like that sense of surrender to him um, you know, what, what do you think in a lot of ways um mm -hmm. i mean first of all hearing this call and just saying yes and and trusting in that 
um, and doing that ag again now has been has been beautiful. But I think also something that's particularly present on my mind right now is trusting my family and friends to God, because it's not very easy to be far away, um, especially when family is going through hard times. Um, you know, my one of my grandmothers passed away while I was on mission, and my two best friends got married. So I got to see. You know, I, I kind of missed some of the harder moments and some of the more beautiful moments. And while that was difficult, I just had this overwhelming reassurance from God that um, there's no place else that I needed to be. Um, and trusting in, in the Lord that if I was giving of myself to him, that he would take care of the rest, that he would take care of my family and friends. And, and seeing that in a very beautiful way in that my relationship with my brother, for example, grew exponentially over the past couple of years. Um, we were talking a lot less, but we were talking more profoundly when we talked. And we now have a much a much more faith-filled relationship and a much more love within our relationship. And I, I could say that about a lot of different people. Um, and also that's not always true, but, but trusting that, that it's God's plan and that um, if I'm responding to something that he's placed in my heart, that he takes care of the rest. And, and really seeking to, to believe that, not just saying it, which is, I think, a challenge. First of all, I want to say thank you um, so much for this talk. It really, like, so I'm Colombian, um, and my dad is an evangelist to Colombia, cool. and all through middle school and high school, to travel down with him on mission trips. Um, and so this, like, brought back a lot of memories for me of just, like, the people we used to work with and see, and just, like, the faith and love and hope, like, those three theological virtues that are so present among so many of the poor in a way that, like, we wouldn't even believe was possible to be. Mm -hmm. um, and just the way that they <coughs> bust me over my life has been incredible. And I just wanted to ask, like, one of the things you talked about is the idea of um, you're there to restore their dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, it's like I see these pictures, right, that you put up of all these people, and I just keep getting overcome, I guess, with just, like, the beauty of them as God's mm -hmm. children. And the idea of, like, they're all made in his image, and they are all created to be like him and to bear his dignity. I want to know, how did you go about doing that? that mission of restoring their dignity, of restoring this idea of, like, you are created in God's image and you are made as his child, and in that you are inherently worthy. Mm. Um, just by loving them. I mean, <laughs> I, I think the, the easiest thing to say is that it's not us. Like, it's Christ. Like, you really are just Christ's vessel, and that's the only way that, that we achieve anything. <laughs> I mean, our mission would make no sense if, if Christ wasn't at the center of it. Like, we would just be on vacation... <laughs> living together in a poor neighborhood, like <laughs> black black tourism, you know, like uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was pretty great, but uh, <laughs> but no, I, that would be kind of the simplest and most true thing to say is that it's it's God. Um, but then you know, contemplating beautiful pictures like this and, and our friends and and also seeing how my brothers and sisters lived this out, um, my brothers and sisters of community. I think through sometimes like just even the way you look at people is very restorative. To look at somebody with eyes of love and, and to listen um, and to just be with them and to say, you know, I'm, I'm here with you and I'm nowhere else. I've got nowhere else to be um, can really restore someone's self-worth in a lot of ways. I think that's true of, of a lot of uh, friends and residents that I had at Colgate that were struggling too, just taking time to be with them, sacrificing time sometimes, um, and just being present to them, um, I think speaks a lot of a lot to, to the love of our God, who is always present to us and gazes on us with the most love that one can imagine um, and, and listens to us, you know? So, so seeking to, to be that to others, um, I would say. <laughs> I wonder if you'd come back ever during, the, during your time to your actual formal experience of education at Colgate, and I realize, you know, I don't want to limit that to classroom learning or whatever, but I, I wonder if there are if there are times uh, when you look back at something that you uh, learned or saw or experienced, uh, you know, here or even in your high school or whatever, that, that kind of, that comes back. Yeah. Um, I mean, you talked about the, the, the prayer formation, which, uh, you know, no, but all the time. Um, 
cla some things from the class I was joking yesterday about uh, making homemade yogurt and having a garden, being a biologist. Those are probably like the closest things to biology that I did. Um, but there were a lot of things that I learned um, in the classroom. Um, well, courses like Professor Vesey's on religion and, and Catholicism and a lot of different courses that I took at Colgate that were outside of my, my field and within my field that opened up to my mind in a lot of ways to different people, to different cultures, to philosophy, theology. Um, so definitely, and also having, we, so we lived in a, in a very poor neighborhood, but we also had a lot of wealthy friends um, and a lot of middle class friends that would have us over to their homes, which was always a blessing, but also a challenge to, to see that they also had the same need, the same loneliness as our humbler friends, but in a more abrasive, um, kind of hard to stomach way sometimes. Um, it's something that we may experience at Colgate sometimes. Um, seeing somebody superficially and then trying to really see deep down and, and see their heart. Um, and so also with them, like, having very intellectual conversations sometimes. Um, great conversations in a, in a group of communion and liberation that we took part of. Um, so a big part of our mission, too, is, is formation intellectually within our community and learning about different artists and, and how we can be compassionate, find compassion in art. So, so kind of forming ourselves to be able to form our friends. Um, we would take our friends to the city, to museums, to different places that they'd never been in their own city, uh, which is cool to introduce somebody to their own country, to the richness of traditions, of carnival, and seeking God in those places too. So, yeah. well, any other questions? I know you m maybe need to get off to 120s. Um, I'll be around too for the next couple of days. I also have pamphlets if um, if anybody wants to know more about Hearts Home. It's online. Uh, I also just ask you all from the bottom of my heart to be praying for me and for our community because the power of prayer is, is super important to our mission. Um, and just be sure that I'll be praying for you all too at Colgate that you're able to live out this mission of compassion that we're all called to where we are. Um, and especially those of you who are thinking about what might come next. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to, to talk to you um, if it's similar to what I want to do or even if it's not at all similar. I would just love to hear.